Hallelujah. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Good morning. (laughs) Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, knowing that this is the house of the living God. He's not on the cross. (laughs) He has risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Today, the Lord has given me a word to share with you. Hallelujah. And the title is simply, He is Risen. Amen. He is Risen. Amen. I trust that after I share the word, we will have more reason to rejoice. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 1. The risen Christ fates reality. Hallelujah. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to Scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due season, due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Let's pray. Lord, hallelujah, you are a recent Savior. On your resurrection, Lord, stands or falls a church, an individual, and a nation even stands or follow God. But Lord, we are your people whose eyes have been opened to see the reality of a recent Savior. Not only have we read in scriptures that everything is true, but we have experienced the reality of your risen life. Hallelujah. And just like Paul, though we may have accomplished things for you, and yet we know it is only by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Though we have this confidence that you have saved us, those who are truly born again, have this assurance, Lord, that when we come face to face with you, we will not be judged but will obtain mercy because Christ our Lord and Savior has risen from the dead. Lord, we give you praise today. Speak again, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You know, the, uh, as I shared the three Sundays ago, the first letter of uh, Paul to the Corinthians is actually the second letter that he has wrote. He's written to the Corinth, uh, Corinthians. There were actually four, but only two survived. And the second is what we know as the uh, first uh, Corinthians. Uh, Paul wrote this epistle while in Ephesus in response to the letter sent to him by the Christians at Corinth. It was about uh, uh, probably five years after he left uh, Corinth. And he stayed at Corinth for about 18 months. So for one and a half months, he planted the church, took care of the church. He taught them, he lived with them, he ate with them, and he labored together with them. But then again, after a few years, the people, the Corinthian believers, sent him a letter. Because there were a lot of problems that plagued the church. 
there was division, there were contentions, there was envy, there was sexual immorality, there was strife, there was marital problems, there were legal problems, believers accusing other believers before an, uh, an unbelieving judge. There were also suffering and persecution in the mix. But then again, we often hear of Corinth as a sin city during its time. And we can relate with uh, Corinth actually as of today because it's much like New York or Las Vegas. We're going there next week. Or San Francisco or New Orleans. They're a picture of the modern day Babylon. But you see, sin and worldliness and carnality have dangerously battered and crept in the church. You see, it's heartbreaking to see church members who fall into these kinds of activities when all along they knew, they know scripture, they know it's a sin against God, they knew they know what is wrong, and yet seemingly they have no power to resist. Because you see, the calling of God has remained unchanged. We are in enemy's territory, just like the people at Corinth were in enemy's territory. They were uh, bombarded by daily uh, 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 you know, attractions of the world. Uh, there was rampant sexual immorality. I'm sure the last time that there was uh, 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 the temple of Aphrodite there, and there were about a thousand prostitutes involved in temple worship, so that sexual immorality became a way of life, just like what we have now. Probably even worse uh, here today, but the calling is the same. And how did Paul address the problems of the people, of the believers at Corinth? If we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we would see there that Paul did not directly address their questions and problems until the 7th chapter. For the six, first six chapters of the, of the letter to the Corinthians, he dealt with issues that were primarily ans- uh, the answer to the problems at Corinth. Beloved, Remember this, he did not address the apparent problem, but he went back to the root of the problem. And what is this? Remember, Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. How do we know that? Because in first, uh, uh, verse 17 of chapter 1, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is, is in essence, we, if we turn back to uh, 15, chapter 15, he summarized there. In essence, it's the life, the suffering, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In essence, in a nutshell, that is the gospel. And then the, the Apostle Paul said, Christ did not send me to baptize or to have more members primarily, but to preach the gospel. Because when the gospel is preached, hallelujah, people will come to the Lord when their hearts are open to receive the word of God. And look what did he say? But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Verse 18, for the message of the cross, and this is the gospel, is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And what did he say? Hallelujah. And this is the essence of of the solution actually that he provided for to the problems at Corinth. Because beloved, it is not the many times our way to solving what we go through. We oftentimes focus on the problem. But many times the problems are just superficial results of the inner problem in the heart of men. And only the gospel can set the captives free. It's only about the victory of, the, of Jesus on the cross and, it, and, it, and the subsequent resurrection is the solution to every problem of men. Because when Christ rose from the dead, hallelujah, God gave us the open door. To be reconciled with Him. So that whosoever believes in Him 
will not perish but will have everlasting life. It is not the issue of the difficulty of the situation. It's not an issue of our, uh, of our inability to deal with our own sins. It's not the issue of your husband or your wife or your children. It's not an issue of the problems in society or the culture. It's always an issue of the life of Christ being made manifest by the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer. The issue is always about life. When the Lord said, be the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Nobody can be that except by the life of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's why in, in, the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the first Corinthians chapter 1, that was the very message that Paul uh, gave to the believers. Remember this, the gospel speaks about the complete and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. His life and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, but what about the gospel? It's about the apprehension or the understanding of the person of Christ and his works. That's why Paul uh, said in uh, chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, I determined not to know anyone among you. Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because He was looking for the, for the result of the work of Christ on the cross. When we say the cross, it's not just about His suffering. The cross is not complete without the resurrection. And so often, during the Holy Week, our focus is on the suffering of Christ. That is great. It's wonderful. But it does not stand alone. The cross is always coupled with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why even in our churches, we don't have the crucifix where Jesus remains on the cross. We have an empty cross because Jesus is not crucified. Jesus is risen from the dead. And if He is risen from the dead and what He said and what He did is really true, we will find it true in the life of the believer. Hallelujah. That is why Paul said, It is the power of God made manifest in the life of those who are being saved. Not just saved in the past, but who are continually saved even in the present and in the future. It is an ongoing act of salvation of God. That's why there is a growing thing in our hearts, the believer's heart. Then when the resurrection of Christ is true, when the work of Christ is true in our lives, we cannot remain carnal. We cannot remain uh, divisive. We cannot remain uh, unspiritual. But we will continue in our walk with God. Many times this, this is the, the problem. One person has been in church. And yet why Lord does he not change? Because beloved, one of the things that Paul made uh, made uh, made uh, he stressed is let's go back to First Corinthians chapter fifteen, because this is really the the the, the fruit of, of the recent Christ. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, the gospel, the life and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. Not only did you receive the gospel, meaning that you accepted it as true, we believe that it's true, but also you stand on the gospel. You stand on the finished work of Christ. And then what did he say? By which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you. Meaning that it is a continuous believing every day. That's why Paul in many ways have said that just shall live by faith. Because when we were declared not guilty and we were declared righteous, we did not feel it. We did not see a, a judge uh, handing down the decision, you are no longer a sinner. Now you are rec reconciled with me. We, we do not know that. But just as Jesus said, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit is like this. You hear the wind. You see the wind by way of the moving leaves. You feel the wind because it blows into your face. You feel it, but you don't know where it's coming from. When we were declared guilty, nobody saw that. And when we were declared, uh, when we were declared uh, 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 not guilty, nobody saw that. 
But we can only see that by the fruit of that declaration in our life. We can see it in the lives of the believers. So again, Paul was saying, be sure that you have been truly been born again. That your life is manifesting the life of Christ. That your life is a product of what Christ has done on the cross. That your life shows forth the reality of the risen Christ. That your life is, is manifesting the beauty, the glory, the characteristic of a man alive in Christ. Hallelujah. That is why... Sorry to, to put you back again to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because there really is, the, is what Paul was saying in the beginning. Look, I thank my God, verse 4, always concerning you for the grace which was given to you by Christ Jesus. That you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge. Remember this. The very journey of every believer starts at the cross. Where he meets our Savior. Where he is forgiven of his sins. He is transformed in his heart. And he, he becomes a new creation. But you see, the resurrection is a statement of God. Because when Jesus died, it pleased the Father. He pleased the Father. The death of the Lord, the life and death of the Lord was perfect. It delighted the heart of the Father. Whatever Jesus Christ did and lived, He actually met all the demands of the justice of heaven. Hallelujah. Everything else really stands on the fact that He rose from the dead. His resurrection is a testimony that God accepted the offering of Jesus. That He delighted in the offering or in the life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That He delighted in the, in the way that it, uh, he, uh, Jesus lived His life and died on the cross. Because He was obedient to the very end. He lived a perfect life. Sin was on Him. And it pleased the Father. That's why His rising up from the dead is a testimony of the Father. Father, that all this were a delight to the heart of the Father. Hallelujah. So, look at what, what, what the, the Apostle Paul said. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace which was given to you by Christ Jesus. He did this to you. Remember that the resurrection of Christ did this to you. Hallelujah. And then what else? That you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge. That you were given what you could never attain by your own ability. You're given the knowledge of who God is. Your eyes were opened. Your mind were opened to the reality, which, to the spiritual realities, which enabled you to know God, love God, and serve God. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that in you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Apostle Paul did not focus on their problems. He focused, he turned their eyes away from all the problems and look unto Jesus and behold the reality, the beauty of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And what is the result? Look at, look at uh, what, what he, he, uh, he said. God is faithful by whom you were, also call, you were called into fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What do we mean by fellowship? It is sharing something in common. And what was common in the life of, of Jesus, it is... The eternal life which He gave every believer. The resurrection life of Christ is given to us. Hallelujah. That is why the resurrection is the foundation of the gospel. It is the cornerstone of all that we believe. It is the crowning event of God's redemption plan for mankind. By rising from the dead, the Lord Jesus showed that He has conquered sin and death. That Jesus is alive gives the absolute guarantee to us who believe that we will also live with Him forever. He was reminding 
the, the, the people at Corinth, look, you have something in common with Jesus Christ. And what is that? It's the eternal life. Amen. And this is really, in fact, verse, uh, verse 9 is the key to all the letter, uh, to all the contents of the, of, of the first uh, letter of Paul to Corinth. This, let me say that again, God is faithful. It's not about your failure. In fact, God has chosen you, the weak, the fools of this world, the nothings of this world, the base things of this world, that He alone gets the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, gives us a guarantee, as I said earlier, that we will be together with Him in heaven for all eternity. Because in the end, there are only two kinds of people. One goes to heaven and one group goes to hell. One receives mercy and the other receives judgment. Hallelujah. One receives everlasting life, the joy of the Lord, and the peace of Christ that surpasses understanding. The other, damnation, torment, and suffering for all eternity. And because Jesus rose from the dead, just as He raised from the dead bodily, so shall we be. Meaning that we will not be uh, resurrected just by spirit. We will be resurrected like the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as He rose bodily from death, we will also rise bodily when it's our turn to be resurrected at the end of time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, just also as we are, as every true believer will be raised from the dead in bodily form, so also those who will be raised from the dead but will be condemned, they will also be raised from the dead in bodily form, but to what? To be what? Condemned for all eternity. Amen? And this is the urgency in the heart of Paul. That the Corinthians will focus not on the things of this world, but on the things that pertain to what Christ has won for us on Calvary. That's why he said, look, Christ did not send me to baptize. I was sent to preach the gospel. I was sent to share the good news. I shared earlier, look, if God wanted us to be worshipers, He would have taken us. Because worship here is limited. In heaven, there's perfect worship. If God wants us to have just communion with Him, He would have taken us out. Because in heaven, there's perfect communion. If God wanted to give us the fullness of that joy that all the inhabitants of heaven have, angels and saints together, He would have taken us to heaven. But He chose. He chose to keep us here. Beloved, we, should, we are a people who have this confidence the boldness, the joy. Hallelujah. Because our Savior has risen. And then He has commissioned us to gather the sheep which are still outside of the fold. Yes. To go into the whole world and share the gospel. Because in this, the reward of the Lamb who gave His life and died for us will be given to Him. And what is the reward? A people who are saved. A people who are chosen. A people who have experienced the reality of the life of Christ. A people whose, by, whose life gives glory and honor to God. A people who live only for God and for the souls of men. A people whose consuming desire is to love God and reach out other people so that others too may join Him. Hallelujah! To worship God, to bring honor to God, and bring joy to the host of heavenly beings just like the Father has this joy for one sinner to repent because it is the Father's joy that the host of heaven are watching and sharing. Hallelujah. Are you with me? That's why Paul was so consumed with the gospel. 
Paul was so consumed in reaching out people. Paul was so consumed, not with his life. The world is crucified to me, he said. And I am crucified to the world. The world has no attraction to me whatsoever. Because I have seen the glory of the risen Christ. That is why his prayer was said, Lord, in essence like Moses, if I have found favor with you, cause me to know you. And that I may know you more. That I may know you deeper. That I may see more and more of your glory. He was a man consumed with that. And he wanted the people at Corinth, the believers at Corinth to be the same. That's why he said, I determined not to know anyone among you. Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because as I pour out my life to you, I, uh, as I spend and be spent for, this, for the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel's sake, and I see you doing the same, that is my joy, that is my, that is the, my glory, that I see you pouring out your life, loving God, hallelujah, and living in the resurrection life of Christ for us. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember this. There is a certainty that when men and women die, they will either go to hell or to heaven. They will either go to the place of punishment or the place of reward and everlasting joy in the presence of God. That is why Paul was so consumed and I trust that as we see and understand the glory of Christ. So one of my co-workers said, why are you always talking about Christ? Why are you always talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? This is not the place to talk about Him. And I asked our, my co-worker, do you love your daughter? Because I, because I always hear this person sharing about the daughter. Yes. And Why? And why do you share about your daughter? There's, there's almost no day that you don't share about what happened to your daughter. Because you love her. You cannot fake it. You treasure the person that you love. You treasure the person that gave himself for you and died for you. You treasure somebody who has given the greatest gift of all. And the apostle said, this is my calling. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, many times when we talk about the cross, we focus on the suffering. But Jesus was different. Who for the joy set before him. Endured the cross, despising its shame. What was the trigger inside his heart? It was the joy of the Father. The Father was everything to him. You know, when he lived here, we know, of course, that the theologians would often say about the the passive and the active obedience of Christ. The active obedience is that He did everything. He did everything that was needed to do in righteousness and holiness. He obeyed completely and absolutely the law. He never broke the law in any way, in any manner at all times. But He also had this passive obedience that the effect of sin was laid upon Him, not only in the cross. That's why the gospel is about the life of Jesus Christ. Because every day he was in the midst of enemy territory where everything else was pulling against him, was laid against him. The thoughts that come into his mind, the acts of people, the sickness, the death, the sin, the effects of it all. He suffered it all. He saw what sin could do in a man or a woman. The gravity of it all, the depravity of it all, he endured it because he wanted to please the Father. 
That was his overriding and consuming desire. In your book, O oh God, I delight to do your will. And then the, in Isaiah chapter 53, it says there, The father delighted in putting, in, in causing him to suffer. It was the delight of the father. That's why many, 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 many um, pastors, uh, I, I heard some pastors uh, say that he is a, a cosmic uh, child abuser. Who would allow his son to be like that, to suffer like that, when he is innocent? And that's exactly because they don't know the heart of the Father. And Jesus came to reveal to us, the gospel has to be preached, not only by way of words, but also by the way that we live. And Paul was very emphatic in that. Where did he get his strength? God is faithful, he said. By whom you were called into fellowship. Jesus is described as a man whose ears were wakened in the morning. And God spoke to him. Whatever he did, it was out of that communion with the Father. He was given the tongue of the learned he was given the wisdom far above his, all his generation and every step of the way because he had such a complete fellowship with the Father. He knew what to do. He knew what to say, but it was at the cost of denying himself. The way to victory, beloved, is the way of the cross. Not the suffering. Yes, we do suffer. But the joy set before us. And that was the very thing that moved Jesus to be obedient. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May we be found to have that kind of love. And how is this possible? Jesus himself prayed in John 17. Father, the love which you have given me may be in them. He made it possible for us to love God in return. That's why He died and rose again so that He could send the Holy Spirit and flood our hearts with His love so that we could love God every step of the way. We could love Him. Despise everything. Hallelujah. That's why the gospel shows who the believers are. Paul was essentially saying, remember who you are. You are saved. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God, the called out ones, called out assembly, which, at, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, those who have been set apart in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. That's the, that's the New King James uh, translation. But in the original, actually, to be is italics. If you notice in your Bible, if you read your Bible, the word to be is italics. It's not there. It was just added. And literally, it is this way. Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called saints. What does that mean? When we are made children of the living God, when we are made children, we don't become not children anymore. Amen? We were made, we were regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why if you are truly born again, that work which the Lord has started, He will bring to completion. He will finish the work that He started. And then look at, look at what the uh, Apostle Paul called them. You are saints. Remember, God has worked in you. He started His work in you. He will bring that work to completion. And though you may find yourselves living sometimes in worldliness and carnality, go back again to what God has done for you. 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember who you are. Remember what God made you to be. You are now called the sons and daughters of the living God. Hallelujah. And then remember who you are. You are not just somebody. You were bought with a price. And the price is the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And remember always what the Lord has done. The grace of God to you. You see. But who are they? Who are they? We know of course in, in the latter part of First Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 1. Paul described them that some of you were for such uh, some of you were fools of this world, the base things of this world, the nothings of this world. And yet in First Corinthians chapter six, he described practically some of them, literally. Chapter uh, verse nine, six verse nine. Do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He specifically mentioned their sins. And then in verse 11, look at what he said. And such were some of you. You know, there's the story about a pastor who read this. And in the middle of his, of his sharing of the word, he just simply stopped. You know what he said? If this is your story, can you please stand? He thought that the Lord impressed upon his heart to call the people. <laughs> please stand. The first few seconds, nobody stood. There was such silence. Then one lady stood up. Then another. Then another. Then another, and almost two-thirds of the congregation stood up, saying, This was me before. The difference between heaven and hell? In hell, sinners are condemned. In heaven, they committed the same sin, but they repented. Repent and believe in the gospel. For such were some of you. Sexual immorality is such a big deal in, 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 in the church at Corinth. Because look, he mentioned specifically the specific sins. But in chapter 5, he mentioned actually about a man sleeping with his stepmother. And he said, look, not even among the Gentiles is this sin. How far have you gone from what Christ has done for you? And yet the doorway is always open to those who repent. Many times we're accused of many things that we are legalists, that we are, that we are this and we are that. You're unkind. You are not loving. But beloved, if somebody, if I were a doctor and somebody comes in with cancer, I do not just tap his, his shoulder and say, you're, you'll be okay. I'll give you Tylenol. You'll be okay. But he needed a surgery in order to remove that cancer. He needed medications in order to deal with that cancer. And we, and many times, this is our battle. Because the Apostle Paul said, look, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. We will be rejected. We will be laughed at. We will be called names. We will be called a lot of things. But beloved, it is with a boldness that even Peter on the day of the uh, of Pentecost, that he preached with boldness and accused the people, you crucified the Lord of glory. Because 
what is needed in the world is not just we are being goody-goody with people because there's no such a commandment that says, Thou shalt be nice. But the Lord has commissioned us, preach the gospel, preach the truth, and be ready for the consequences. Because even your children will go against you, husbands against wives and wives against husbands, and children against parents, fathers against daughters, and mothers against sons, whatever relationship we have. But when we stand on the truth, we know that we are standing Hallelujah, on solid ground. The gospel, because the gospel is the power of God to set people free. Hallelujah. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Justify means you were declared righteous. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When the Lord declares us righteous, He treats us as righteous. Are you with me? He treats us, you know, the, 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 the relationship is established as children of God and as righteous, even though we may fall, we may fail, God treats us as His children. Hallelujah. You know, it's, it's always easy to find faults with people. Are you with me? It's always easy to find faults with people. But when it comes to your children, you stretch a step wider, then a wider, then wider. That's why it is a challenge to discipline our children because there's something in our heart. There's something in our heart that prevents us sometimes from drawing the line. And our problem, my problem personally is, where do I draw the line, Lord? Teach me. Where do I draw? And for spiritual children, it's the same. Lord, where do I draw the line? For, for your people, for your sheep, that once that you feed, you take care, and then they go a certain direction. You run after them, and they run away from you. But the Lord said, feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. In what manner do we feed the lamb and feed the sheep? Peter, do you love me more than this? It's the love of Christ. That's why remember who you are. Remember whose you are. You are owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. And if He has promised because He owns you and you are under construction, when Jesus the contractor constructs something, He is, we are sure that He will finish. Amen. There's this one, uh, my, my uh, 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 acquaintance of mine was uh, hired a contractor. You know, in winter time, he wanted to have the uh, opening in the roof. What do you call that? The, there's a solar, uh, sunroof? Yes, a sunroof. Skylight. A skylight, a skylight. They made a hole. His big mistake was this, he paid in full. That's, that's in upstate New York. He paid in full and the contractor never showed up again. Middle of winter, the roof is open. So he had to hire somebody. But when God begins to build us, beloved, he finishes what he has started. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The grace that comes from God. But did the Lord really rise from the dead? And that is the issue. Did he really rise from the dead? So let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know what the Lord, uh, what the Apostle Paul said? After, uh, verse 5. And that he was seen by Cephas, meaning Peter, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom greater part remained to the present. So, during the time that uh, Paul was writing this, a lot of people, the greater part, meaning at least more than half, more than half of the 500, more than 500, were still alive. To bear witness to the fact that Jesus truly rose from the dead. Because there were eyewitnesses. In fact, one of the qualifications of, a, of an apostle was that he, that person has seen Christ's resurrection. He has seen the risen Christ. 
That's why many questioned the authority of Paul because they knew that Paul did not walk like the other 11 or the other 12. Paul did not walk with them. But Paul proved by so many things, the signs and wonders that came with his ministry, and the fact that whatever he preached, it was what? He testified of the truth of the word of God. Hallelujah. And then he said, uh, after that, after that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one, as by one born out of due time. There were eyewitnesses. Hallelujah. So in other accounts, of course, there were the women who first saw Mary, of course, in John chapter 20. And the, the other, other women and the, the other witnesses, like in Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus. There were the two other disciples. But you see, the attack on the, of the truthfulness of the rising of the Lord Jesus Christ was there since the beginning. What did the Pharisees do? The Pharisees and religious leaders wanted him dead and to keep him dead. So what did they do? They postered guards. They covered and sealed the grave by the stone, with the stone. They bribed soldiers who guarded the tomb. They spread rumors that his body was stolen by his disciples. But the proof of death was plentiful. Hallelujah. There were eyewitness to his crucifixion, death, and burial. And even, even the... Uh, it's not, it's not an accident that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were involved here because they were part of the Sanhedrin. There were two at least. There were two at least uh, members of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is the uh, ruling council of, 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 of Israel composed by uh, elders, uh, usually the, the religious, the chief priest including, and the, uh, and the priest and the Pharisees. So they took the body of Jesus and buried the, the, the Lord in a tomb. It was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, actually, in whom the, uh, uh, the body of Jesus was buried. And how does this play out in us so that we always keep in mind the resurrection of the Lord? He instituted two, two things. One, baptism. Because in baptism, as we put the, uh, the person down under water and then raise him up, it is actually to identify with the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our identity, that we once were dead into sin and then raised from the dead together with Christ. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 13, verse 4, For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. And then the second one is communion. What did he say? Do this till I come again. So that we remember, you will not wait for somebody who is dead. We wait only for somebody who is alive. He will come Again, hallelujah, hallelujah. And in, in, in Acts chapter 1, if we go there, Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 1, just to lay down the foundation of, uh, of the witnesses, look at uh, what Luke wrote here. The former account I made of Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in, in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. So he presented himself to the apostles. Why? So that they will be sure that they are sure that they are sure. They are Put, they are brought to the place of full persuasion that Jesus Christ is alive. And that is why they were called to be martyrs. Look at verse 8. Oh, let, let me finish the verse, verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during... Uh, 40 days. So for 40 days, the Lord just uh, uh, showed Himself and probably walked with them. He taught them. He opened scriptures to them. 
and by being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, they began to understand what this is all about, what the calling is all about, and why they were chosen. And this is really the last commission of the Lord for them. Look at verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Specifically, this was for the apostles. They were all called to martyrdom. All of them. Of course, except Judas. Except, of course, John, the beloved. Somebody tried to uh, make him a fried chicken. He was thrown into the boiling cauldron of oil. And yet he survived. By Tradition says that he survived when he was put in a boiling oil. And nothing happened to him. But it was to save him in order that he may write the book of Revelation. Which was written actually when he was in his 90s. When all the rest of the apostles already died. No wonder. Why? Why? This is all about the cross. I, I used to think that the, the Lord, the Lord actually, I used to think that the Lord called these apostles early on in his ministry. But examining scriptures and reading and reading commentaries and reading, of course, uh, uh, the, the Bible, checking out the Bible, it began to dawn on me that the calling for the twelve came at the middle of his ministry. He was left all around 18, 18 months. So, but at what point did Jesus pray? At what point did Jesus pray and chose the twelve disciples? It was when the Pharisees. Let's learn. Let's look to uh, Luke chapter six because this is where really where where they were chosen as twelve. Okay. So when Jesus performed a miracle in uh, in uh, healing the man on a Sabbath, verse eleven. They were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. In fact, in other, in other scriptures, it says there in Matthew chapter 12, I guess, that they started to plot the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Jesus sensing that, he, he gathered, he prayed and chose 12 among them, among all the disciples. And he had to fast track the training for the remaining days of his life in order to prepare them. To prepare, because it was in the middle of his suffering and persecution that he prayed and chose the disciples. So they actually were being prepared by the Lord because the Lord was had such a sense that, look, his ministry was about to end. And he had to have people, a group of people, to hand over the work of the gospel. And he chose the twelve at that. But what a choice. Because in the end, they willingly gave up their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why my prayer as I was preparing this, Lord, make us the same. That we willingly live our lives not to build houses, not to earn more and more, not to have just temporal. These are good. I'm not saying you don't build houses. All I'm saying is that we don't focus there. We focus rather on the gospel. If God were to give us riches, then praise God. But use the riches in order to reach out souls. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is why Paul and the rest of the apostles were so consumed with that desire as the work of the Holy Spirit. They no longer live for themselves. They no longer live for their own pleasures and comfort. They saw, look, God, I see it now. I may suffer today. But you see, I am investing my life for what will come next. Because you said, as I live you shall also live. So Lord, if you die and get resurrected, you are the first fruit. You are the firstborn. And if you are the firstborn, there are somebodies coming after you. And it is the church. Hallelujah. So we no longer see suffering as stranger. We're no strangers to suffering. We rather go because look, a true born again believer cannot be somebody who refuses to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
Because all born again believers willingly embrace the cross. Not because they wanted it for themselves, but because Jesus gave them the desire to do so. Amen? Hallelujah. And lastly, the resurrection is our hope. I skipped that uh, one, the latter part of uh, chapter 15, but let us go around on it uh, to end. Hallelujah. In closing, the resurrection of Christ is our hope. Verse 12, Now if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Can you imagine? If there's no, because there are some people who believe who don't believe in the resurrection, like the Sadducees, they don't believe in resurrection. There are people, even among us today, theologians at that, learned in the gospel, in, in the in the Bible, students of the Bible, and yet they refuse to believe that there is such a thing as resurrection. So, if Christ did not rise from the dead. then our preaching is empty. We're just wasting our time. What is the use of preaching if Christ didn't rise from the dead? And your faith is also empty. It's vain. Why believe? Why don't you just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you shall die? Do like what the Romans do. And when you go to Vegas... Let it stay there. You know, you know the saying? I don't know how, 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 how is that said, but whatever you do, let it stay there. Because it's so wicked. Let me put it that way. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. Every preacher who preaches Jesus Christ will be found to be a liar. If Christ did not rise from the dead. You see, everything stands or falls on the rising or the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are false witnesses. We're just fooling ourselves. Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up. So we accuse God even of, the, of lying. In, uh, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. He repeats that. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Your sins are not forgiven. My sins are not forgiven. What's the use of singing the songs, Christ is alive, Jesus is alive. He has taken all my sins away. If He is not truly alive, then my sins and your sins are not forgiven. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Oh, what a life. He made a fool of Himself living for Christ. And all for nothing. And then, verse 19, uh, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. What a fool we, we are if Christ does not reason. But, and that is the but, hallelujah, Christ is indeed risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's this, uh, there's this uh, uh, pastor who said, Look, I stood in the empty grave of Christ in in Israel. And all around me, His own people rejected what He did. My heart cried out for them. And beloved, our family members who refuse to live for Christ, who think they are okay, who refuse to name the sin a sin, because they want to love people. Even though Christ defined certain things in life as sin. People would rather love people. But hate God in the process. As pastors, we cry out. Lord, may your people find you uh, as who you say 
he were. And live in a way that you want us to live. Godly in an ungodly society. Willing to lay down our life. Even though rejection and suffering and persecutions and trials may come. We don't know sometimes what we are saying, Lord. But Lord, I trust you because you said you are faithful. Because Lord, even in my weakness, you have offered to be my strength. When I find myself nothing, Lord, you fill up myself and offer yourself as my everything. When I lose my, my parents or my siblings, oh God, you have filled me with love, Lord. Able, able to simply love them so that they will know that through my life I touch them, oh God. That through my life they will know that they have been touched by the living God. Lord, may I never lose the patience. May I have your loving kindness, O God. May I be your extension of grace. Because God, you rose from the dead. And when you said you rose from the dead, you will pour out your spirit. And the Holy Spirit is ours for the asking. We don't have because we don't ask. But Lord, you said, when we ask, the Heavenly Father will never refuse to give. Because even we, if we are evil, Lord, know how to give good gifts to our children, oh God. You will never refuse the cry of your children for the Holy Spirit to enable us to live the life of Christ. To show forth to the whole world that God, you are alive indeed. That your rising up from the dead is not futile, O oh God. But Lord, worth it all, O oh God. Everything that I can give you and ever give you is worth it all. You are worth it all. My God, you are worth it all. Hallelujah. Let there be joy in the hearts of your people. You are alive. And you said, Lord, as you live, we also shall live. And we experience that life, hallelujah, here on earth. But God, we will have the fullness of that life. When on that day, we will come face to face with you. And walk and see the one who gave his life for me and you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your work on the cross. Bring us deeper, oh God. I have just... Lord, that's the surface of what it means, Lord, for you to rise from the dead. Lord, but whatever I have shared is enough for me at least, Lord, to rejoice in you. It's more than enough reason to raise up my arms in thanksgiving, oh God, for what you have done, for what you're doing and what you're, you will do, oh God, not only for me, but for my family, Lord, and for my friends, and for this church, and for the nation of, of the earth, oh God. Lord, Lord, thank you. Hallelujah. For your obedience. For your love, O oh God. May you receive the honor and glory for what you have done on the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. Lord, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.